Welcome to the Robotics for Infectious Diseases interview series. I'm Dr. Robin Murphy. I'm the Raytheon Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M and a founder of the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue. And for this episode, we have Dr. Chris Sion here to talk about things that roboticists need to consider in getting their great and wonderful ideas into a hospital or healthcare system. John is highly qualified to talk about this. He's a MD plus he has a PhD in biomedical engineering. He's the vice dean of the engineering medical program with the Texas A&M's engineering and medical colleges in Southern Medicine's hospital in Houston. And he's an inventor, most recently of the do-it-yourself N95 kit that's being produced for Houston area hospitals. And he's made it available on the web. So welcome John, or should I say Dr. Doctor. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll respond to lots of things. And, and doctor, <laughs> doctors want, but uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, I'm real excited to be here because because I want the work of uh, the people in your group to, to be most beneficial. Uh, we're in a time of crisis, so so we need uh, uh, lots of people to contribute. And roboticists are smart people, and we just often don't understand the, the, this very complex public health and public safety domain. And so Dr. Richard Borles is gonna be the interviewer today. Rich is a professor. He's also director of the Purdue Robotics Accelerator at Purdue University. And he was organizer of the White House Office of Science, Technology and Policy Workshops on robotics for the Ebola outbreak in 2015. He also helped birth the National Robotics Initiative and the Innovation Corps program while he was at the National Science Foundation. So. So Rich, please take it away. Well, thank you, Robin. John, welcome from a fellow Boilermaker. Thank you. Um, I would like to start with some advice for robotics professionals, be they scientists, entrepreneurs, or business people. You know, if, if they have a solution, either clinical, logic, logistical, security, or just continuity of work in government, you know, who would they contact and, and who should, uh, should they contact to integrate this tool into the response? Uh, it's a great question, and, and I'll probably only be able to talk about the medical side. Uh, my expertise outside of that's limited, but if you have medical applications, uh, then clearly FDA is going to be the governing authority for, for much of what you do. Uh, you know, I, I doubt the, the robots are, are trying to be metabolic agents, so, so they're not going to be drugs. So it's going to be the centers for device and radiological health that, that's probably going to be um, engaged. And... Uh, one thing I like to start with is just what is a medical device? Um, so if, if you can answer yes or no to that, then uh, uh, you can either check the FDA off or talk with the FDA. And, and a medical device is anything that makes medical claims. So, so if, it, uh, if it is going to help with diagnosis or treatment of disease, uh, then it's probably a medical device. Um, if you want to stay away from the regulations, I see a lot of people trying to claim exercise or claim health. They stay away from claiming treatment or diagnosis because that'll put them in the category of uh, FDA regulations. Okay, great. Um, speaking of FDA regulations, you know, what are the regulations they need to be uh, concerned about, and and what would regulations might be waived um, for experimenting with new technologies like robotics during a response or during a community exercise, for that matter. So, of course, the big one is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, with the medical device amendments. So, so th that's what governs uh, pretty much all of uh, medical technologies. And uh, the, the regulations, I think, are, are nicely developed uh, to be very risk-based. So, so the regulations are, are most exhaustive for the highest risk. Um, and, and then as you step down in risk, uh, they become less and less, um, I guess, exhaustive or, or thorough. Uh, just, just because they don't want to inhibit manufacturing um, at, at the same time, if, if there's high risk, then there, there just needs to be stuff there. So. And in experimentation. So, so the clinical indication, I think, is going to be the, the most critical thing to delineate. So, so why is this being used, I think, uh, has to be at the forefront. Uh, if you're just doing proof of concept, you're probably not doing R&D, and that's unregulated. So, so the, uh, uh, the FDA doesn't regulate R&D because they want to see a lot of design cycles. They want to see uh, iterations. 
Uh, it, but, but once you decide that uh, the proof of concept is over and you want to design or develop things for a particular clinical indication, uh, now you're walking down the, uh, the area where the design controls, which is in 21 CFR Part 820, are, are really going to be critical. So you're going to have to follow design controls and quality systems uh, regulations to do so. Now, experimenting with humans um, isn't necessarily something that FDA has uh, sole authority over. I think in general, every institution is going to have an institutional review board. And, and no matter what you're doing, if it involves the use of humans, you, you are going to have to get IRB approval. Um, or you're going to subject yourself to all of the liability. If you injure somebody or if you, you cause harm, um, you know, there's these things called uh, manslaughter, uh, gross negligence. I mean, there, there's lots of things you are exposing yourself to, both criminal, you know, as well as tort. Uh, so you're, you're going to have to have institutional buy-in anytime you develop something for, for use with it. And if there's some risk involved, particularly, then IRBs are, are going to want to, you know, have, have good consent forms, all of that. So... So that's great. I mean, the key is there are uh, still rules in place to make sure we do responsible such work. Um, is there funding available for such a rapid introduction? Uh, yes, indeed. So I, I think uh, federal agencies, state agencies, local, um, and even A&M, we, we have some uh, funds that we're developing just internally uh, to meet the needs. And in this time of crisis, I, I encourage everybody to, to really listen to the needs statements. And, and go after the needs. I, I don't necessarily think this is the time for your pet project or, or your, your idea to, to really be at the forefront. Um, you know, it, it's not, you don't want to make the most of a crisis to push your own ideas or own research. Uh, I think at, at this, in crisis stage, I think as engineers ethically, we have to listen and say, what are the needs and what's going to be the best solution for those needs? And, and and my experience in medical device development, medical technologies, is we are a very low tech industry by design. So, so we, we kind of shy away from the latest materials, the latest technologies, because there's just too much risk. The, the risk is in the application. People can die if they don't, you know, if the device doesn't perform right. So, so we don't like any risk in the technology whatsoever. So if you're thinking of a high technology, you know, latest and greatest solution, um, be prepared for, for people in the medical field to say, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> it's just, you know, there's just way too much risk on that. Now, now that's okay if the indication is well-established. So if you have a well-established indication, a very traditional way about going about stuff that, that everybody's familiar with, uh, basically there's a published performance specification then we might consider new technology solutions to that. But, but if it's new technology, a new indication, that's going to be a no-go. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good advice. You know, keep, uh, keep tabs on, on the, what the user's needs really are. Um, what, do, what do healthcare providers and responders need in order to prepare them effectively to work side by side with robots? Um, I think the burden's more on the roboticist, to be quite honest. I, I think, uh, particularly not right now, uh, my experience is working with clinicians and surgeons is uh, they will be clinicians and surgeons, right? They're going to be, it's going to be very unusual for them to step outside that role. Uh, so, so now many of them have uh, computer science training. Many of them have engineering training. If you can find a clinician or somebody that does, uh, then you can all uh, speak the same language. But, but other than that, uh, you're going to need an interpreter or you're gonna to have to read up on stuff in order to, to really do that, to bridge the knowledge gaps. Are there particular areas you think um, of those knowledge gaps uh, roboticists should be uh, familiar with or aware of? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, safety, pr protection of uh, you know, patients as well as uh, doctors. Uh, I've, I've been seeing more and more robots in the, uh, in the you know, halls of the hospital. What I almost ran into the other day was a uh, you know, disinfection robot that uh, uses uh, UVC, it just walks the halls of a Houston Methodist Hospital. And basically it, it's got, uh, you know, wheels and everything just, just goes around from room to room. 
and has a, a, a basically a sensor to, to say how much UV radiation it's putting out and it keeps it in a range to, to basically kill bacteria and viruses. So, so the, the great outdoors has wonderful UV to kill things. So we're just bringing that, that UV into the hospital. And uh, so there's lots of ideas out there too, though, uh, to, to bring automation basically to, to regularize and uh, you know, uh, perform tasks that, that uh, humans don't necessarily want to do. Very good. So, so speaking of that, you know, what is it the greatest need that you think uh, robots could address in a pandemic? Yeah, I mean, if, if they could, uh, you know, kind of like the surgery robots, I don't know about testing robots, that, that would be kind of neat because we're exposing a lot of healthcare workers to, to, to running these tasks and doing stuff um, to, to be able to do that a little bit remotely, even if it's just the next room over, right? Uh, coronavirus, to my knowledge, can't uh, go through walls yet. So, so it doesn't have to be remotely like across town. It can just be in a setting where we're, uh, you know, where we're not exposing the, the healthcare worker to, to potentially infected patients. So, so I, I think there's, and that's a pretty low tech solution on, on many times. I, I think it, uh, you know, the, the patient's awake, they, they, they're aware of the surroundings. They, you know, as, as long as it's not a fast moving arm or something like that, I, I think there's, there, there's a good safety that we can throw. So, so wherever you see, um, you know, uh, direct healthcare contact uh, with a potential patient, if, if that can be done, you know, with a robot, I think there, there's definitely advantage there. All right. Now, when you say testing, do you think um, this is largely in a case of a pandemic? I'm assuming that could be, um, for example, inside the body, like oral um, um, swabs or uh, outside, uh, you know, taking uh, um, surface temper measurements or whatever. Is that, uh, are there, uh, that the type of testing you're uh, envisioning? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think, uh, you know, nowadays when they do the testing, they do take the temperature and they, they look at uh, what is the risk uh, of, the, of the person being exposed. Uh, so yeah, I think multi-sensors. I, I talk to clinicians, the one that are doing it to, to really get the best information on that. Um, I, I think the, uh, you know, work locally to uh, find out what they need. I, I know in Houston that they, they need some, um, you know, some basically rooms to do the testing in that are easily sterilizable. But if you had a robot, that becomes much less of an issue. So. Well, that is so cool. Thank you so much. We're, we're out of time, but we really appreciate you sharing with us. And I really like the positive view of what robots can do. So everyone, uh, watch the Robots for Infectious Diseases webpage uh, for more of these types of interviews, reports, and other activities.